Please welcome, Philip Royer. <laughs> Thank you, Edith, for that most charming introduction. <laughs> I told some of my friends at SAP India that I was coming here, and they shook their head and said, oh my God, everyone in Israel has got a 200-point IQ. So I have to tell you, I'm terrified to be here. <laughs> but thank you so much for your gracious invitation. I'm very pleased to be here on my first trip, and it won't be my last trip to Israel. Thank you. Um, I used to be a merchant banker and on my 40th birthday I decided to take all the money I ever made and give it away with warm hands and die broke. And so far we're right on budget. <laughs> so as uh, I do was say, um, I'm basically involved in providing things like schools, clinics, shelters, sanctuaries for children, animals, the environment, that sort of thing in the countries that have um, developing countries, um, in, in, you know, China, Laos, India, Cambodia, uh, parts of Africa, South America. So that's basically where, where I operate nowadays. We're not an organization, it's just the two of us. Um, but we, uh, we seem to have uh, a quite a good impact where, wherever we go in a, in a fairly small, modest kind of way. Now, King Lear, late at night on the cliffs, asks the blind Earl of Gloucester, how do you see the world? And the blind man Gloucester replies, I see it feelingly. And shouldn't we all? You know, Rudyard Kipling, the author, wrote of young men dying in World War I. And if they ask you why we died, tell them that our fathers lied. That legacy of lies continues today. Everything we think we know about the meat and dairy industry is a lie. You see, the world today is crying out for only two things, leadership and the truth. Today I'll simply tell you the truth. The wise Chinese have a term for it, Zheng Jiao. Listen to the friend who tells you the truth, even when it hurts. So let's just tell the truth fearlessly and forcefully. That is what the Sanskrit word satyagraha means, the truth force. Now Brendan Kennelly in the book of Judas wrote, if you wish to serve your age, betray it. But what does that mean, to betray your age? It means expose its lies, humiliate its conceits, expose its arrogance, and condemn them to face harsher truths. And Alvin Toffler said that the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. Now, I've always admired Count Moltke, the great Prussian general, a brave soldier who preferred to think rather than to speak, a man silent in seven languages. You see, it actually takes courage to stand up and speak, but it also takes courage to sit down and listen. Now, there was a time when my favorite food was filet mignon and lobster, a fact for which I'm so profoundly ashamed today. So, what made me decide to leave the world of lobsters and Learjets in exchange for shelters and slaughterhouses? to take nothing but pictures, own nothing but memories, leave nothing but footprints, kill nothing but time. You see, something happened to me. I had been to Dante's Inferno, but unlike Dante Alighieri, I did not have Beatrice for my love, nor Virgil for my guide. I heard the screams of my dying father as his body was ravaged by the many cancers that killed him. And I realized I'd heard those screams before. In the slaughterhouse, on the cattle ships to the Middle East, and a dying mother whale as a Japanese harpoon explodes in her brain as she calls out to her calf. Their cries were the cries of my father. They were identical. And I discovered that when we suffer, 
we suffer as equals and in their capacity to suffer a dog is a pig is a bear is a boy so when I look into your beautiful faces today I think of the words of the Greek poet Horace change only the name and my story is also about you so this is where we work today in 90 seconds I'll try to flick through some of our 500 projects um, don't avert your eyes it only lasts 90 seconds if you can possibly manage it in China 7,000 magnificent moon bears their limbs torn off in traps are imprisoned in a steel coffin welded shut as a catheter drains bile into a bucket which the Chinese drink the bears can't move they're in agony for 26 years they go insane in Korea where we built a big hospital for animals dogs are beaten to death in the marketplace because Korean butchers believe that fear and suffering makes the meat tasty in South Africa 5,000 tame orphan lions are drugged and killed with guns spears or torn apart by hunting dogs and they call it sport in Canada 300,000 baby seal pups are clubbed and skinned alive on the ice their tiny hearts are still beating in my country Australia we killed 90 million innocent kangaroos who adorn our coat of arms the largest land animal slaughter on the planet what a disgusting legacy and we from Australia sent millions of animals on these death ships to the Middle East and other places where their eyes are stabbed out and their tendons are slashed every penny I invested in the Bassettine slaughterhouses in Cairo was utterly wasted in Asia where we're quite big dogs are suspended on steel hooks and skinned alive to make fur trim and coats which are sold in the West and many of you would know my involvement with Sea Shepherd fighting the Japanese in Antarctica and other places so we know something about the oceans the, we treat the oceans like a, a public toilet and as a private pantry the Pacific gyra now is so full of plastic junk and human feces it's created a floating footprint bigger than India dolphins and whales are stabbed to death in the shallows of Taiji in Japan and the Faroes Islands and huge bays are blood red 100 million sharks are torn from the sea and their fins are hacked off and they're thrown overboard to die agonizing deaths for shark fin soup and factory farms spew chemicals into the ocean creating hypoxic dead zones of 1 million square kilometers killing coral plants and ocean animals and so-called unviable dairy calves who cannot be sold for veal are killed by dairy farmers smashing their heads in with a sledgehammer or jumping on their rib cages and crushing their hearts that is the law that is how you have to kill them because that is more humane than the way the farmers used to kill them billions of bouncy little chicks are ground up alive in mechanical mincers simply because they are male and we travel around the world quite a lot and we observe religious sacrifices from many religions which make the 21st century look like the new dark ages and children starve in poor countries because their crop lands now grow crops for foreigners I won't show you any more pictures but that's our workplace nowadays it's not as pleasant and as beautiful as sap now in human history only 100 billion human beings ever lived 7 billion people are alive today and we human beings torture and kill 2 billion sentient living loving animals every week 2 billion and we stab and suffocate 1 billion ocean animals every 3 hours trillions of fish are ground up into pellets to feed to livestock vegetarian cows are now the world's largest ocean predators the oceans are dying in our time by 2048 all our fisheries will be dead the lungs and the arteries of the earth 
As you would know, oceans sequester more CO2 than all the forests of the world put together. 10,000 entire species are wiped out every year because of the actions of one species. And we now face the sixth mass extinction in cosmological history. And I've just been talking to your wonderful CEO upstairs and I said, if even half my algorithms are correct, it means that no child under the age of five will ever reach retirement age. It's a mathematical impossibility. If that does not chill your blood, if any other organism did this seriously, a biologist would call it a virus. It is a crime of really unimaginable proportions. Now, there are two peak predators on this planet. On land, it's the human being. And on the ocean, it's the orca. In the 20th century, human beings killed 200 members of their own, 200 million members of their own species. Orcas killed none. And in the 20th century, 100 million people have been killed by their own governments. Now, Victor Hugo said there is nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. But I say there is nothing more destructive than a bad idea whose time has passed. The time for meat has passed, if it ever existed in the first place. But fortunately, the world is changing. 20 years ago, Twitter was a bird sound. WWW was a stuck keyboard. Cloud was in the sky. Skype was a typo. 3G was a parking space. Google was a baby's burp. And Al Qaeda was my plumber. Now, the most beautiful word ever written in any country, at any time, in any language, in human history, came from India, from the Upanishads 3,000 years ago. Ahimsa, non-violence to any living being. Now, people often ask me to define myself. What am I? So I invented a new word. I said, I am Ahimsan, a person who rejects violence in whatever form. So by definition, I must be vegan. Veganism becomes the baseline for an ethical life. Not because it de describes your nationality, your religion, your politics, your diet, or your lifestyle. But because it describes your character. That is the message. It defines your character. It says we oppose violence wherever and whenever we see it. You see, it's not just about animal rights. It's also about human wrongs. Animal rights is now the greatest social justice issue since the abolition of slavery. And you can put that in the bank. It is a revolutionary event more powerful than the Industrial Revolution, the Reformation, the Hubble Telescope, or anything ever conceived by Galileo, Copernicus, Einstein, Darwin, or Freud. Because it protects the most precious of all things, life. We, the vegans of this world here in Israel, we are on the right side of history. We are creating the new enlightenment, the second renaissance. Let it begin in Israel. Now, Christians know the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It comes from the New Testament of Jesus. But actually, it goes back even further to the Babylonian Jew, Hillel, 70 years BC. In fact, it goes back even further to the Analects of Confucius, 500 years BC. And the truth be told, it was inscribed on the human heart long before the dawn of writing. Now, the anthropologist Margaret Mead said, never doubt that a few committed people can change the world. Indeed, that is the only thing that ever has. So can we do it? 
You know, there are only 13 million Jews in the world, but they play such a vibrant role in international affairs. Look at the number of Nobel Prizes they win every year like clockwork. Trix and I sat in the stadium at the Olympic Games, full of pride, as Australia, with a population of only 20 million people, won more medals than every country in the world, except for the United States and Russia. Tibet's population is only 3 million. But who hasn't heard of the plight of the Tibetan? But there are over 600 million vegetarians and vegans in the world. And that is bigger than the United States, England, France, Germany, Spain, Italy, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Israel, all put together. If they were one nation, they would be bigger than the 27 nations of the European Union. And despite this massive demographic footprint, we are still drowned out by the raucous hunt and shoot and kill and cartels who believe that violence is the answer when it should not even be a question. You see, animals are not just other species. They are other nations. And we murder them at our own moral peril. Now, the great historian Barbara Tuckman defined folly as acting against our own best interests. That's folly. Well, it's foolish to do that. And Occam's Razor, named after the 14th century Jesuit priest, he said this, when presented with a number of possible solutions to a problem, the simplest one is always the best. And that concept is used by you guys, engineers every day. It's by lawyers and courts and scientists. So let's just briefly apply these tests to the meat and dairy industry. Forest depletion by the meat industry costs three times as much as the recent global financial crisis, and it happens every year without anybody noticing. Zoonotic diseases coming from animals to humans now threaten a pandemic to rival the Black Death, which wiped out half of Europe. The World Bank now says that one influenza pandemic alone would cost $3 trillion. And it's no longer a question of if it will happen, but when it will happen. And two million people already die every year from zoonotic diseases. And 75% of all the infectious diseases of the last 30 years came from animals out of factory farms. And of course, meat and dairy is killing us and our economies uh, with cancers, heart disease, osteoporosis and diabetes. I often say that after 1945, the end of World War II, there were three startup countries, like startup companies, and they've all proven what great statesmen can do. First one, one I know best, Singapore. What a success story in any language. Number two, India. What a success story. Number three, Israel. What a success story. But in Singapore, I was there last week and I've discovered that 34% of all the young Singaporean women uh, under the age of 30 will have diabetes before they're 65. And Singaporean girls, uh, women, are highly educated. Education is their mantra. India. Dr. Kasli, while writing in the Lancet magazine, said, India will account, and it already achieved it before the print was dry, accounts for 70% of the world's cardiovascular disease. And most of them are vegetarian. It's because of their dependence and love affair with dairy. So our diets are killing us and our economies. Medicare has already bankrupted the United States. They would need $8 trillion invested in treasury bills just to pay the interest, eight trillion dollars. And they have precisely zero. They could shut down every school, university, army, navy, air force, homeland security, FBI and CIA, and they will still not have enough free cash flow 
to service their long-term unfunded Medicare liabilities. Can't be done, mathematically impossible. But it's hard, you know, how big is $8 trillion? It's hard to get your head around. I'm just a country boy, but I can't get my head around it. Well, that's how much it would take for the whole of Asia for the next 10 years to rebuild or to build the infrastructure for electricity, road, water, telecommunications, high-speed rail across China, ports in Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, India, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka, plus the new Silk Road from Central Asia into Europe for the next 10 years. That's, that's $8 trillion. It is four times as big as India's GDP and double the total reserves of India and China combined. And all of this for the, the fact that you like the taste of meat and dairy. And Americans are getting fatter and dumber every year. And Australians and New Zealanders, we're all the same. Now this gentleman would know this better than anyone else. Uh, water is the new oil. Nations will soon be going to war over it. Underground aquifers that took millions of years to fill are now running dry. I drilled my first bore well when I was a young teenage boy scout and we struck sweet water at 80 feet. This year we're building an orphanage in the same area and at 800 feet we're sucking mud. At Ch in China at 3,000 feet the drill head is still dry in China. Now everyone in this room would be outraged if 10 jumbo jets crashed every day with no survivors. Well, the same number of children die every day from water-related diseases. The mighty Colorado River, the Rio Grande, the Indus, and the Yellow Rivers now no longer reach the sea. In fact, the Colorado, the Colorado River doesn't even go to the Gulf of, the, of Cortez anymore. It stops, stops before it gets there, as you know with your research. And at the same time, four billion people are starved of water every year. So why do I speak about water? Because it takes 50,000 liters of water to produce one kilo of beef. It takes 1,000 liters of water to make one, kilo of, uh, one liter of milk. And a dairy farmer in the West gets 28 cents a liter for it. What a preposterously stupid industry. Mad Hatter economics on steroids. If that industry had to pay for their externalities, it would be bankrupt in two hours. Today, one billion people are hungry. 20 million people will die this year from malnutrition. Cutting meat by only 10% will feed 100 million people and going vegan will end malnutrition forever. And food prices are skyrocketing. It used to cost me for Thai rice for my projects in Southeast Asia, 197 US dollars a ton. And then the price went up to 1,015. A five-fold increase in five months. And poor countries sell their grain to the West for hard currency, whilst their own children starve in their arms and the West feeds it to livestock. So we can eat a steak? Am I the only one who sees that as a crime? Of course not. Everyone here does. You see, every morsel of meat we eat is slapping the tear-stained face of a hungry child. When I look into her eyes, do I remain silent? If everyone ate a Western diet, we would need two planet Earths to feed us. We've only got one and she is dying. The earth can produce enough food for everyone's need, but not enough for everyone's greed. Now we know that greenhouse gas pollutions from livestock vastly exceeds those of transport. Cars, trains, buses, ships, lorries, the whole lot. And their methane is 20 times, much more than 20 times, more potent than CO2. The melting Siberian permafrost is now a ticking time bomb. When it releases its sequestered gas, the game is over. 
Just look what's happening on the Yamal Peninsula in Russia. Now, you would know that the Himalayan ice fields are correctly called the Third Pole, like the North Pole and the South Pole, because they feed half the world's population through the Indus, the Ganges, the Brahmaputra, the Yangtze, the Irrawaddy, and the Yellow Rivers. And these glaciers are melting fast. I presented all these numbers uh, to a speech, in a speech to 2,000 wealthy Indian entrepreneurs in New Delhi, including Amartya Sen, who was sitting in the front row, just like you are today. And, uh, and he, he j had just received the Nobel Prize in Economics for India. And I mentioned to Muhammad Yunus after he won the Nobel Peace Prize that all the good that he had done with Grameen Bank would vanish when Bangladesh drowned. To say nothing about Manila, Mumbai, Calcutta, Ho Chi Minh City and Bangkok. And then we had dinner with Al Gore and I discussed the same numbers. And a few weeks ago I gave a speech in Melbourne with Dr. Peter Dirty, Australia's Nobel Prize winner in medicine. No arguments at all from these great minds, but lots of arguments from our grubby Australian politicians and their cronies in the meat and dairy lobby. So Upton Sinclair was right. It is impossible to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on him not understanding it. <laughs> Admiral Denny McGinn said this, he was, he's a chief of US war fighting requirements. We have learned that nations will raid and invade long before they starve. And out in the West, we freak out when 1,000 refugees arrive on our shores in leaky boats. Just imagine greenhouse gas emissions hitting 500 parts per million or a three degree temperature rise, creating 100 million eco refugees every year. 100 million. This calamity will reshape the geopolitical landscape forever. We are facing the perfect storm. If any nation had developed weapons that could wreak such havoc on the planet, we would launch a preemptive military strike and bomb it back into the Bronze Age. But we can't. It is not a rogue state. It's an industry. The good news is we don't have to bomb it. We can just stop buying it. So George Bush was wrong. The axis of evil does not run through Iraq, Iran or North Korea. It runs through our dining tables. Weapons of mass destruction are our knives and forks. And increasingly nowadays, our chopsticks. You see, the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. This disgusting industry will end because we run out of excuses. Now, President Lincoln's inaugural address, he appealed to the better angels of our nature. But I say we must also destroy the dumber demons of our lusts. There is a wonderful Swahili saying, if you wish to travel fast, travel alone. If you wish to travel far, travel together. Today, we no longer have the luxury of that binary choice. We have to travel far and we have to travel fast. So I say that veganism is the Swiss army knife of an ethical and authentic future. One instrument solves all our health, environmental, financial, water problems, and ends animal cruelty at the same time. Veganism has become an enchanted key. It opens locks to secret rooms in your own castle. And it rearranges the furniture of your mind. Veganism is our friend. It's our future. And it's the only future worth having. And paradoxically, farmers are the ones who are the most to gain. Farming won't end, it would boom. Only the product line would change. Farmers would make so much money they wouldn't even bother counting it. And I'd be the first to applaud them. We should tell our governors and our, our governments and our leaders 
veganism is the engine of redirected economic growth. Governments would love us. New industries would emerge and flourish. Health insurance premiums would plummet. Hospital waiting lists would disappear. Hell, we would be so healthy, we'd have to shoot someone just to start a cemetery. <laughs> and at the same time, veganism gives us the peace dividend. I addressed the World Parliament of Religions and I said, the peace map is drawn on a menu. Peace is not just the absence of war. It is the presence of justice. Justice must be blind to race, color, religion, and to species. If she is not blind, she will be used as a weapon of terror. And there's unimaginable terror in those ghastly gulags we call factory farms and vivisection laboratories. Lord Ekin, in fact, said that under those circumstances, this is where absolute power corrupts absolutely. And of course, talking about peace while still killing animals is like loving literature and burning books. They're mutually exclusive ideas. They are incompatible in the same way that science is incompatible with the Flat Earth Society. So in my own journey through Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, I've learned that a man is measured not by how much money he makes, but how much of it he is willing to give away, particularly to strangers. And if you wish to increase a man or a woman's share of happiness, do not aim to increase their possessions, simply decrease their desires. Socrates and Epicurus were right. The unexamined life is not worth living. You see, my heart resonates to the words of W.H. Auden. If equal affection cannot be, let the more loving one be me. Martin Luther King said, Cowardice asked the question, is it safe? Expediency asked the question, is it polite? Vanity asked the question, is it popular? But conscience asked the question, is it right? Is it right? Our governments need to develop a new kind of jurisprudence, a new legal system, a Latin term called foro conscientiae a court of the conscience. Now I speak to audiences all around the world, sometimes it's small groups and sometimes it's up to 5,000 people. And they're all good, decent, caring, loving people. And they all want to change the world. As long as they don't have to change themselves. But life does not work that way. First we change in our hearts and then the world follows. True leaders must face their own demons courageously. Martin Niemöller, the German priest, philosopher and U-boat captain, spent eight years in prison for condemning German intellectuals for being cowards. And he wrote, when the Nazis came for the communists, I remained silent. I was not a communist. When they locked up the Democrats, I remained silent. I was not a Democrat. When they came for the trade unionists, I did not speak out. I was not a trade unionist. When they came for the Jews, I remained silent. I was not a Jew. And then they came for me. And there was no one left to speak out. Men and women must speak out with integrity and force and act courageously. Is it not better to light a candle than to curse the darkness? All the darkness in the world cannot put out the light of a single candle. You see, I believe another dawn is coming. And if I close my eyes, I can hear her heartbeat. She's on the march. So do not be afraid of the meat and dairy industry. Always remember Mahatma Gandhi's words. First they ignore you, 
then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. <coughs> the last sentence of Scott Fitzgerald's book, The Great Gatsby, reads, so we beat on, boats against the tide, drawn back ceaselessly into the past. I ask you, are we to live forever in a sick, smug and cruel past? Let's not relive history. Let's make history, because that is what leaders do. They make history. Judge White's closing words in the bonfire of the vanities were these. The law is humanity's clumsy attempt at decency. So I plead with you all to join us in a battle, in a war, that decency cannot afford to lose. Because in the end only three things matter. How deeply you loved, how gently you lived, and how gracefully you let go of things that were not meant for you. Meat was not meant for you. Our animal cousins have survived millions of years of evolution. They've earned the right to share this planet with us in peace, and they have waited long enough. The brutes and the bullies have been Goliath. But David is coming. Maybe he's in this room. Maybe he's one of you. And if not you, who? And if not now, when? Thank you all for being here. Yes, I know. I had dinner with the producer and the director three weeks ago. <laughs> I highly recommend it if you haven't seen it. And one of the things that um, I felt there is there is um, a village in Indonesia that uh, lives off the manta ray gills. Yep. And it was very interesting how they came into um, a place of discussion. Yeah. And the village said, you know, if you take this away from us, you need to give us a different livelihood. And I could understand how these people, this is the only thing that they know, you yep. know this is their livelihood, and we need to give an alternative, and not just come and say, okay, you know, we, we have to stop this killing, because, you know, this is what they, um, what they know, what they know of their life, yep. and the interesting answer was that um, your kids and your kids' kids won't have any manta rays anymore, yeah, so anyway, you have to build this alternative, Yep. but it's, I think at the end of the day, these people, you know, they're very simple people and this is the livelihood and they're interested in today and not tomorrow and the kids and kids and kids. And I think this is a big challenge. It is. Um, There's a follow up in the last uh, four, four or five months. Uh, no, it doesn't matter what happens. The mantas are dying out. Yeah. Climate change is changing that. The manta food is cleaning it out. Long line fishing is killing it out. Drift netting is killing it out. People blame the poor villagers for going out and killing a few mantas, and I don't want them to do that anyway, but really it's the big industrial complex that's killing them. So what they are trying to do now is, and quite successfully, is having tourism. Mm -hmm. Little Australian companies, startups in Australia, are now doing boat tours, mm -hmm. going out there, going out diving and looking at the mantas. Um, and so now they're getting hard currency, and it's, uh, at least there's a, a light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. Yeah. Is it um, black and white? Is it enough to say I'll reduce? Or does it have to be vegan, vegetarian, vegan? But, uh, I, d I don't think uh, you can be halfway pregnant. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah. I, and I think once you become vegan and the new markets open up, new products, new foods, new ways of thinking, new clothing. I mean, look, my shoes, 
my shoes, my belt, my watch band, no animal products in it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, once you, as I said, once you, bec I, I, the word vegan has all these connotations, you know, carries with it all sorts of baggage. But once you, your mind, you become our himson, it really does rearrange the furniture of your mind. You think differently and you wonder, why did I even think that way? Why could I st still think I could have some meat or some chicken or drink some milk? It, it's, it's still keeping the juggernaut of the animal industrial complex going. Go, just go cold tur turkey and you'll never look back. It's, yeah. Yes, How did you get to become a vegan? Okay. <laughs> um, used to be a merchant banker. Short story. We won a mandate, huge mandate to advise a massive conglomerate, owned many different industries. And I was a quarterback, I was the, like the boss to run the assignment. I went down to have a look at all the operations. And the first one of the operations I went to see turned out to be a slaughterhouse. I'd never seen a slaughterhouse before. And I have to tell you, you know, we were a young man, a bit like you, very fit, strong, tough, we were macho. I went in there and it completely terrified me. It broke my heart. It affected me so deeply and profoundly. I woke up at night for so long, screaming with nightmares. One of Melbourne's wealthiest Jewish families, huge. Um, and I decided to become vegetarian. And there's a con but then very shortly there, I didn't know anything about dairy. And I happened to be on a business trip advisory assignment in India. And I was there in my merchant banker suit walking down the street and I saw a dairy farmer dragging his cow to the slaughterhouse. And the cow had been hit by a lorry and had broken her spine. And he was dragging her on a rope, but she couldn't move very well. So he was throwing chili powder in her eyes and sticking sharp objects up her anus to make her move. And he did, succeeded. And alongside her was her starving, skinny, scrawny calf. You know, you can't, the cow won't give milk without a calf. So the calf was alongside, nearly dying herself. And they got to the slaughterhouse gates and he handed her over to the butcher. But before he handed over the cow, to the butcher, the bastard milked her. Now, if that does not change the heart of a man, nothing will. So when I went back to Australia, I went out and studied the dairy industry and I found out milk is meat in liquid form. It is the most cruel industry you could possibly imagine. You have no idea how cruel it is until you study it. You'll never drink another drop of milk as long as you live. Never. So I became vegan. That's ready. Another question. Hmm. I'm not exactly vegan, but uh, you know, when I'm living in the world, there's also agriculture suffering from uh, disease, bees, we have all this genetic modified. Yeah. So it's very hard to find real vegetables and fruits around. Yeah. And, uh, so how do you see this changing? So yeah, I know. I, I had a conversation with, with one of the executives from a company called Monsanto. Mm -hmm. You heard of them? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I yeah. Them, yes. <laughs> 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 and he said, "Don't worry about that. We'll take care of you." Yeah, and when. Anderson? No, I don't know them. No. That's the US company. US, yeah. When, when, when a corporation tells me, don't worry, we'll take care of you, just leave it to us, I, I, I'm a bit cautious. <laughs> um, there's plenty of room for good, high quality organic veg. I mean, you, you're an expert in this. Matt, you should answer that question. <laughs> well, actually, I know Monsanto, I know Chem China and Adama. And they are taking care of good quality food all over the world. It's up to us to ask for good quality food. We can do this change, we can make the change. If we 
ask for good quality food. That's it. If the market changes, I can tell you businesses will change like that. Businesses are very adaptable. Uh, so if you, if you demand high quality stuff, mm -hmm. you'll get it. And you'll get it at a good price point and you'll get it quickly. Uh, but um, the past is a, is a foreign country. We don't, we're not bound by history. It has not served us well. We're not bound by it. We can change rapidly if we want to. And we have no choice. As I say, by 2048, all our fisheries are going to be dead. You know, I, don't, I find it very hard to get people's head around that concept. Because when the oceans die, we die. We die. And it's not a zero-sum game, you know, that the animal rights activist or the environmental activist, his gain is the meat industry's loss or vice versa. No, it's not a zero-sum gain. If those guys win, everybody dies. And this is how, how serious it is. The meat and dairy, you know, China is, pe people ask me for my professional advice sometime. You know, what time, what, what's your forecast for GDP growth or interest rates or foreign exchange prices or unemployment rates, all this kind of, or the environment or human rights. And I say it, I don't care what the question is. The answer is always the same. India and China, India and China, India and China. Whatever they do, if they, if they get a cold, we get pneumonia. Now, I don't know what's happening in, in uh, Israel, my first visit. But I can tell you in Australia, Chinese are there with a checkbook. They're walking around buying everything. If it's not nailed down, they'll buy it. I bring out a delegation from China to Australia every year, bureaucrats, to try to influence them in some way. And then we were in Shanghai a couple of years ago and one of them said, you know, Phil, we're buying land, um, crop lands all around the world leasing croplands. I'm not talking about 100,000 acres. I'm talking about 1 million square miles, that kind of size. He said, we call Africa China 2 and we call Australia China 3. You come to Australia and you see our big dairies, our big farms. We got one farm, I think it's something like 10,000, what was it more? I think it might be 100,000 square kilometers. They walked and they say, yeah, we like that. Yeah. So uh, all the problems that we're facing now, we're, we're, the West is becoming veganized. Well, just like the tobacco industry, when the West decided we, they're gonna cut down on smoking, the tobacco industry said, no problems, we'll go to China and India. The, the same lawyers, the same advisors are acting for these companies. But this time they're acting not on tobacco, but on milk and meat and dairy and fishing. So we have two battles. We've got to fight battles at home, you know, in countries like the West and Israel and to get our, our citizens to change. But the harder battle is trying to get India and China to change. And that's going to be difficult. I've heard that you, tomorrow you will be in the of Israel? Yes. What will be your message then? The same? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I have to go. I have some meetings tonight, but I won't go to, sleep, to bed tonight. I'll, I'll sit up and I'll write something. <laughs> uh, but I think... Uh, what do you expect from me? They haven't told me. <laughs> uh, I thought it, I was just there for comic relief. But I basically... <laughs> what I think I might do is talk about brand Israel. You know, why can't Israel be, as I said, you know, why can't this, this be is Israel's contribution to the 21st century to create this massive paradigm shift in, in our consciousness, to get us off the meat and dairy drug, to live a more compassionate, intelligent, rational, sustainable um, existence. Why can't it? Why, Israel's quite used to punching above its weight, if you know what I mean. If that, do you use that term here? punch above your weight. Yeah, why not? And it's not rocket. I mean, what you guys are doing here is rocket science. What I'm talking about is not rocket science. Any fool can do that. So, do you think it's the lawmaker's place to do this? Or move this forward? I think it's, yeah, uh, I think it's the lawmaker's 
way, a role, to respond to the community's demand for a better life. And if we can get that message across, they are not our, our political masters, they are our political servants. I don't know if that's true in Israel, but certainly in Australia, I tell them. Yeah. Yeah, I, I say that to our politicians, say, you know, I could hire you as easily as I fired you. You know, you really should be mowing my lawn or washing my windows. I won't be saying that, of course, but uh, um, yeah, yeah. there goes my Israeli citizenship I've been trying to get. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, any other questions? That, uh, yes, ma'am. Well done. Usually I answer this question, what do you eat? You don't eat this and that, and you feel like a lifestyle. But today you brought this idea that we're on the right side, and thank you very much. We've already won the intellectual war. We've won it. That debate's been had a thousand times. We've won it. It's just that the sheer momentum, the force, the inertia against us, it's like a locomotive, it's not slowing down. We've won that. It's just that all we can, I can hear is the death rattle of a moribund industry that just refused to, refuses to die. Um, and I guess uh, ultimately it comes down to individuals. You know, we, when I was a young man, I always said, you know, in the first half of my life, I wanted to have a successful life. And the second half, I wanted to live a significant life. And they will spot. But now that I'm older and hopefully wiser, I think I was wrong. Everyone here is so young. Why can't you have it all at the same time? A successful life and a significant life. That's not rocket science. That's simple compared to what you do every day. So I wish everyone here great health, great happiness, peace, success, and a life of real significance. And thank you all for having me.